Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. This is our uh, part two okay, of the lecture, Trespass to Person. So in part one, we have covered um, the topic assault. So this is the continuation of part one, which is uh, meant to cover or to discuss about uh, battery. Okay, so what's the meaning of the word battery here? So basically, battery is um, intentional. Okay, now because we are talking about intentional thought, so it's intentional and direct application of force. So that's the keyword force, okay, towards another person, okay, towards the plaintiff without that person's consent. So what's the, the aim? Okay, what's the objective of uh, the law governing trespass to person, especially battery here? So basically, the, the law is meant to protect okay, a person's dignity and reputation. Okay, nobody has uh, deserved okay, to be uh, inflicted with uh, unlawful uh, act okay, or force here by another person. Okay, let's move to the elements of battery. So if we compare with uh, our previous uh, discussion, okay, with this, there are there were okay, there are three elements of assault, and for battery also there are three elements. Of course, different elements. All right, the first element here is hostile intention, and here is not equated. It's not equivalent with violent. So the word hostile here, you want to know? We are going to discuss after this. And then the second element is direct force. So the first one, hostile intention, all right? And number two, second element is direct force. And then we proceed with the third one, which is the act is committed without lawful justification. It's not justified okay, to commit or to do such an act. Okay, all right. So we move to the first element. Okay, let's discuss it further. What's the meaning of hostile hostility or hostile touching? Yeah. All right. So to constitute battery, okay, there must be a hostile touching. So you uh the claimant, the plaintiff must prove this element of hostile touching. Okay, the case, the relevant case here is Collins and Wilcock, 1984. Okay, so basically. Uh, in this case, all right, it was stated that if the touching was unlawful, so of uh, meaning that here it was hostile. So in other words, whatever is hostile, usually it is unlawful. Whatever is unlawful, it is hostile. And then um, in another case, okay, uh, three years later, 1987 here, all right, we have the case of Wilson and Pringle reported in Queen's Bench here. Right, it involved schoolboys. Plaintiff and defendant, okay, so both of them were schoolboys, okay, schoolmates here, all right, in the same class, all right. So one day, okay, um, something happened here. What happened? Plaintiff alleged that defendant intentionally jumped onto plaintiff back, I meaning they were playing around in the class, all right. So it caused, okay, causing him to fall, causing plaintiff to fall and injure his hip. So he got injured okay, during uh, this uh, action here, right? However, the defendant argued that okay, he just pulled the back of plaintiff's shoulder. I think it's something quite common, okay, uh, especially primary school, okay, primary school boys or students, okay, all right? So just pull the back of plaintiff's shoulder, which was actually an act of ordinary horseplay. So it's something which is common, ordinary, okay, among students as between pupils in the same school. Just, so this is basically the defense or the, argue, the argument okay, on the part of the defendant. So the court held that, uh, the fact, this is called a, a, a appeal decision, okay, um, it was held that defendant was not liable. So again, uh, meaning that here, the court actually um, uh, agreed okay, with this uh, argument, okay, contention on the part of the Defendant. It was just an act of ordinary horseplay. There's no hostile intention okay, when they were playing together. And then, uh, in respect of battery, okay, uh, the rule of law here, all right, the court held that okay, uh, in a battery, okay, there must be an intentional touching or contact of plaintiff by 
the fundant, okay? And then that touching, first there must be touching, intentional touching, and that touching, okay, must be proved to be a hostile touching, okay? Touching and it has to be hostile. And then hostility, okay, cannot be equated with ill will or malevolence, okay? All right, and hostility is just a question of fact. So it depends very much on the situation. So in that situation, it involves two, um, two school boys, okay? This is uh, primary school boys here, right? And then the court said, well, it may be imported from the circumstances. It depends very much on the situation of the, when it happened, all right? That's why the court of appeal decided that it doesn't amount to battery here. There's no hostility, okay? There's no hostile intention. And then, um, in R and Brown, okay, in 1993 case here, House of Lords stated that, okay, if the act, if an act was unlawful, so it was hostile. So we have to look whether the act was lawful or unlawful. If we were to apply this rule to Wilson and Pringle, so hostile, is it lawful or unlawful? So it is lawful, so it's not really hostile. Okay, so this means that, okay, this is the, our analysis. Okay, here, this means that any touching of another's body, okay, is in the absence of lawful excuse, okay, capable of amounting to be a battery and a trespass. Meaning that, yeah, if you touch somebody's body, okay, without any excuse, without any justification, so it might amount to battery, okay, all right. Okay, uh, and then still about Wilson and Pringle here, okay? So, when the defendant knows he is doing some act which the plaintiff will object to, okay, all right? And it is not acceptable conduct. So, um, uh, it differs from society to society, generation to generation. It depends on the, very much on the situation, okay? Maybe in some uh, um, uh, part of society, okay? For example, Malaysian society, okay? Especially when they are eating, you cannot touch on person's um, uh, head, can, all right? I mean, without any reason, okay? You can't simply touch on the head, okay? Without any reason. So, it depends very much on the circumstances, okay? Whether it is actually acceptable conduct or is, is it not acceptable conduct. Okay, we move on to the second element. Okay, just now we were discussing about hostility, hostile touching. Okay, another one is application of force to the, to the person of another. So, um, if we refresh with the uh, earlier discussion of the topic assault, okay, it doesn't involve force okay, for assault. But for battery, the, the, the key element it involves, it has to be certain, it, it has to be proved that it involves Force, okay, uh, application of force on the part of the defendants towards plenty. So, what's the meaning of the word force here? Okay, any physical contact with the body is sufficient to amount to force. The moment you have contact, okay, physical contact with body, then basically this actually amounts to force. It is not necessary that plaintiff suffers from physical hurt. Okay, not you don't have to prove. Uh, you suffer hurt, okay, or you uh, you become injured because of reports. Not not no need okay, to prove, to prove that. Okay, it does not matter whether the battery is inflicted directly by the body of an offender, by the trespasser, by the uh, defendant, or through the medium of some weapon or instrument controlled by the action of the offender. So you are here, you just throw something and it hits the, the other person. So is it a force? Yes, it is. Uh, do you actually hit him, touch him? No, okay. The the the, the things actually the thing that you threw, okay. But then still it amounts to force here. Okay, so it doesn't have to be direct here, right? Can be done, it can be committed through medium. Okay, we have the case. This is uh, our local case, all right. The case of is Tiong Pi Hyong and Wong Siu Giu, okay. Right, defendant, uh, it involves women, okay, here. Defendant, out of jealousy, okay, resulting from plaintiff association with her husband, okay. So, defendant attacked the plaintiff, right, and scratch her face, neck, and arm. So, the scratch here, the act here, it caused injury, okay, um, towards the plaintiff, right. So, now plaintiff is suing the defendant. 
So is it a case of battery? Does it amount to battery? Yes, okay. So the court held that yes, it amounts to battery. And her jealousy here, all right, it, uh, it does not excuse her action. It doesn't justify. So it doesn't make the, the act lawful. Okay, you can't take the law with your own hands. Okay, here, all right. So obviously it is a case of battery. Okay, the third um, element okay, without lawful justification. So if a physical contact or touching with another person's body is not justified by law, then obviously it is a battery. But okay, so we have the but here, qualification here, all right. But, but if the touching is justified, you can justify the act, then it is not battery, despite the fact that you have fulfilled the first two elements okay there was hostility and then there was um infliction the force okay all right involved but the moment there was some lawful justification it is justified then there's no case of battery it doesn't amount to battery okay this is some example of lawful justification here okay um we have a number of justification example here we have at least four okay the first one is lawful arrest okay, by the police. Okay. If the arrest is unlawful, then the arresting party is liable in battery. So basically, in normal situation, the police has the right to make an arrest. So it is um, a lawful arrest by the police. Of course, in order to arrest the person, um, the, person the person, okay, the police has to touch or must, uh, it involves certain force, obviously. right? And then another uh, example of lawful justification, okay, children, may be subjected to subjected to reasonable punishment okay? usually by parents or even by teachers it depends but here the word is maybe it depends very much on the situation okay? what the extent of the punishment here okay? we have the word reasonable punishment another one reasonable and proportionate force may be used in self defense meaning that here if you are using certain force in order to defend uh, yourself okay so basically, uh, it doesn't amount to battery. You can't be liable for battery. Why? Because of the defense of self-defense here. Another one is consent on the part of the plaintiff. So you consented to the force. So later, you, can, you can't really uh, sue the other person for battery. Because why? You give your consent okay, from the very beginning. Okay, and then uh, in regards to uh, lawful justification here, okay, especially the word consent is now, all right? There's also some discussion on uh, revolving around consent in medical treatment, okay, all right? So, um, especially here, all right, generally, okay, it is a battery, normally, okay, the, uh, generally speaking, the rule is that it is a battery to administer medical treatment to an adult who is conscious without his consent. So if the doctor wants to do some treatment okay, to an adult, a patient who is an adult, and he, or, he is conscious, okay, and he doesn't give the consent. So you can't really force him to accept the treatment. For example, to, uh, to do injection, okay, okay, you can't really do that. Okay? The doctor cannot do that. Okay? But what if the patient is uh, not conscious? He okay? cannot give consent. Okay, all right. Okay, he, if the patient is incapable of giving consent, okay, but uh, he nevertheless needs medical operation or treatment, so in that situation, okay, the doctor may treat him without the patient's consent, especially in urgent situation, and um, it will take time, okay, time consuming to contact relative or to give consent, for example. So in that situation, in order to save life, so yes, you can uh, proceed without uh, asking for. Consent and doctor cannot be liable for battery later. Okay, so the, the doctor in such a situation, in such circumstances, will not be uh, liable for battery if he proved that the operation okay, or treatment he carried out was in the best interest of such a patient. So uh, it is necessary okay, in that particular situation. We have the case of F and West Berkshire Health, Health Authority. Okay, and uh, for Malaysian case, we also we have the case of Mahmoud and government of Malaysia and another in 1974. So it involved police here. Okay? The police get chased after two persons get seen running from the scene. Okay? Uh, the police saw two, two persons okay? where seizable offense okay, was reasonably suspected to have been committed. 
So later when you learn um, criminal law, okay, there are categories of offences, especially seizable and non-seizable offences. Usually seizable is uh, the most uh, the more serious one, alright? So despite the repeated warnings here, okay, plaintiff and his companion, the two person here, continue to run away, alright? So it gives the, I mean, suspicious, suspicious situation, okay? Right? So the police fired a warning shot, okay? Alright. So, um, uh, the relevant um, statute here, the act here, okay, section 15, section 2 of CPC, Criminal Procedure Code here, right? It entitles the police okay, to use all means necessary to effect the arrest, okay, without being liable for battery litter. Okay, and this is actually the judge, uh, the decision by Yong Che, uh, okay, here, the judge here. So, the, uh, he said that, okay, a police, the court said that a police cannot, however, use more force than is necessary to effect their arrest or capture, nor can he cause their death, okay, unless the alleged offence is one punishable with death or imprisonment for life. So, otherwise, the police is not justified in doing what uh, they did, okay, all right? So in this case, the court held that okay, plaintiff failed to prove his allegations that he had been shot by the police officer negligently and without warning. The police actually gave warning before shooting. Okay? So in that situation, the police was justified okay, as a last resort to fire the shot to effect the plaintiff's arrest and prevent him from escaping. Otherwise, how to arrest? Okay? How to stop the, um, the, the, the suspect okay, from escape, okay, from escaping here. So it doesn't amount to battery. Okay, we have another case also involving police here, uh, Daning bin Laja and KK Haji Tuaran bin Majid here, all right, 1993. So a policeman fired a shot at the plaintiff while chasing him, okay, all right. And then plaintiff later sued the police, okay. Plaintiff claimed it was done intentionally and maliciously, okay, with, uh, bad intention, okay, without lawful excuse. So the court held that there was battery, okay, um, and then actually the second um, uh, argument here, okay, it was not necessary to complain malicious intention for the thoughts of battery. It's not um, an element to be uh, proven, okay, in the thoughts of battery. So now you prove all the three elements, okay. So in this case, as compared to the earlier case, okay, uh, it amounts to battery but uh, in this Mahmud and Gabo Malaysia okay, it doesn't amount to battery because it involves seizable offense here but in this case uh, um, the, the, the decision was different okay the, it amounts to battery okay another subtopic under um, uh, a, a battery here all right we also want to discuss about doctrine of transferred intent Meaning that in some situation, you can actually um, transfer your intention, okay, quote unquote. So what's the meaning here, okay, transfer intent? This is a legal doctrine, uh, rules or principle of law, okay, which allows the intent to be shifted from intentional thought that the defendant tried to commit to the intentional thought that defendant actually committed, all right? So it allows the defendant to be held liable for an intentional thought, he intended to commit against A, but instead accidentally committed against B. Meaning here, uh, for example, the defendant tried to hit A, but then he missed A, but he eventually hit B. All right. So can he be liable for B, for battery? The answer is yes. Why? Because of this doctrine of transferred intent. Okay, so if the defendant intended to commit an assault, okay, uh, or battery against A, but in the attempt to commit a, one of these thoughts here against A, okay, he accidentally commits the thought against B. So the defendant in that situation can be held liable for the thoughts against B, especially battery against B, because that, that's the actual force okay, inflicted on B rather than A here. Right? We have a very famous case okay, on this uh, transfer intent. Uh, the case is Scott and Shepard. Okay? Um, uh, and then actually another um, name for the case, okay, commonly known as famous squid case, okay, because it involves squid. Squid is like this, okay, it's like crackers perhaps. Okay. So uh, Shepard, okay, um, the defendant here, 
he tossed a lead squid okay, into a crowded market, okay, like this crowded market, where it landed on the table of a gingerbread merchant named Yates. So he tossed a squid and then he just threw it, okay, and then it landed on the table of Yates. Okay. And we list a bystander because market, so many people crowded, grabbed the squid okay, and threw it across the market to protect himself and the gingerbread. So he's a, he, was, uh, he wanted to save Yates and also wanted to save um, the people nearby. All right, so he just threw the script away. Okay, unfortunately, okay, the script landed in the goods of another merchant named Ryan. Okay, so from Shepherd to Yates, okay, Willis took it and then to um, threw it and then it landed on Ryan's table. Ryan immediately grabbed the script okay, and tossed it away, accidentally hitting Scott in the face just as the script exploded. You need that here? Uh, grab and then uh, toss it, okay, and then hitting Scott. That's why now Scott is suing Shepard, the first one, the first people, I mean the first person who threw the, the lead script here, alright? So because of that, the explosion put out one of Scott's eyes. So it caused a serious injury to Scott's here, the plaintiff. Alright? So this is the decision okay, by the court. Majority held that Shepard was fully liable, okay, because the this is the, the quotation, okay, the judgment by the the grey case, okay, the chief justice here. He said, I do not consider the intermediaries. So who are the intermediaries here? All right, uh, yes, okay, Willis Royal here, all right. Uh, as free agents, okay? I mean, they shouldn't be liable, okay? free agents in the present case, okay? but actually all of them here were acting under compulsive necessity. It's like you react, uh, I mean, that's your automatic reaction, okay? Yeah, compulsive necessity for their own safety and self-preservation. And another uh, judge here, Nars J, he said that, well, I am of the opinion that trespass would well lie in the present case. Natural and probable consequence of the act done by the defendant, by Shepherd here, okay, was injury to somebody. Okay, when they did that, somebody will be hurt, obviously. Okay, and therefore, okay, the act was illegal at common law. So obviously, it is a case of battery. Okay, so now let's compare and contrast assault. So we have covered uh, elements for both assault and battery. Okay, now let's compare, make some comparison um, of assault and battery. Okay, the first question, can there be an assault without battery? I mean, you want to hit, okay, and then you didn't hit. Okay, is it assault without battery? Or can there be a battery without an assault? You hit, okay, without instilling fear, okay, on the part of the um, plaintiff, for example. Or can they be both together. Can you prove okay, in one single action, okay, the also both assault and battery. Okay, so this is the comparison here, battery and assault. So basically, um, in majority of cases, actually here, all right, usually assault precedes battery. First assault and in a monster battery, okay, all right? That is why some say that an assault is an attempted battery. It's about to commit a battery, okay? So battery requires physical contact with another person's body. Okay? You must prove elements of physical contact. Okay? For example, throw water at a person is an assault. But if any drops fall upon him, it is a battery. Okay? The act of throwing, you, want, you wanted to throw, okay? so it amounts to assault. Okay? Because fear on the part of the plaintiff. But then the moment any drops of water, it falls okay, in both here. Fall, I mean, uh, fall upon um, the the other person, okay, the, the, the plaintiff, then it amounts to battery. So assault here requires no physical contact of touching. Okay, all right, this is the distinction, okay, how we distinguish between assault and battery. Okay, and then, this is the answer to the earlier question, okay. There can be battery without any hint of assault. Okay, example, blow from behind inflicted by an unseen person. Because why? There's no fear. Okay, I mean, somebody's uh, hit you from the back. So you cannot see, but that's a force. Okay, all right. So there can also be assault without battery. Okay, where the blow was intercepted uh, or prevented by some third person. You want to hit, but then somebody stopped you. So it's just an assault without 
nanti okay alright we discuss Stephen Myers last time okay in a meeting followed heated discussion following heated discussion defendant threatened to hit plaintiff and advance with the clenched fist okay remember so others at the meeting stopped him before he could reach the plaintiff he was being stopped so he was liable for assault there's no battery no actual hitting yet here Alright, so basically that's all for um, the topic assault and battery, especially battery here okay, for this part two of the lecture. So hopefully um, you are able to follow the discussion. So we'll stop here. We are going to continue later with um, uh, false imprisonment. Okay, until then, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.